Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a review. And if you've watched my 7,000 subscriber celebration video where we did a top 77 artisanal fragrances, I did leave a couple out uh, from that video. Many people pointed out I didn't include Prince brands. I didn't include Suga, TSVGA's, Fiona, which easily probably should have been on that list. Uh, I didn't include houses like Slumber House or, you know, those kind of houses, which I guess you could consider artisanal. But uh, one house that was heavily represented that I realized I did not have many individual reviews. Well, that's not true. Let me take that back. I had a lot of individual reviews on the channel on, but they were not of the ones I own full bottles and have talked a lot about over the last couple of years, two, two plus years on the channel. And so today we are going to be reviewing my favorite if not for Oud Maximus, this is probably my favorite. And you know what? Wearing it today, I'm thinking, man, this very well may be. I put Oud Maximus, the, the top Bortnikoff, and then I put Lao Oud right behind it. But man, wearing it today, this is a damn close. It's it's neck and neck. Uh, and so today we are reviewing the aforementioned Lao Oud from 2021. And if you know your Bortnikoff history, you know that the first Bortnikoff bottles from eight, 17, 18, 19, I think, came with a wood cap. Uh, all the way up to 2020, they changed it to this, board, this um, what I'm calling like a Roja Dove looking cap. For some reason, it just reminds me of sort of Roja's style. You know, it doesn't have the bedazzle, uh, but when you take the plate along with the now metal cap, it just gives me big Roja vibes. And I actually like this, although it's, it's much heavier, but my favorite is the wood cap. I love the wood cap. I think it's classy, and it speaks kind of to the roots, you know, of uh, Bortnikov. I just imagine him and Russian Adam out in the jungles hacking down vines trying to get to these rare oud trees, right? Um, and so this speaks a little bit to that. And, and speaking of how artisanal some of these houses are, look at the bottom of this bottle. Look at this stuff. Um, that is not filtered out very well, which is okay, you know, but the color of the juice is absolutely magnificent. Um, but whenever you buy these artisanal houses, sometimes you're going to get sediment in the bottom of the fragrance it's fine doesn't affect the fragrance or anything like that but um this is 350 dollars for 50 mil so this is what i was talking about yesterday when i did my video on amber cologne so go check that out if you're interested in a cologne but his cologne line is cheaper so that one was 220 dollars for 50 mil this is 350 uh for 50 mils and uh, but before we do that before we get into the review which i've been wearing all day as my scent of the day and i know it very well i actually um have a decant. Actually, I want to give a shout out to the person who got me on this fragrance and uh, gave it to me as a gift, if you will. So hang on one second, and I'm going to show you. I guess I should have had this ready. All apologies, but it hit me, and I feel like he deserves a shout out. So we're going to do this on the fly. So this is from Lee from Frag Fragnanimous is his company. Fragnanimous, and he sent me some very generous things over the over the years, and he um, obviously sent me this decant, and this decant is what really got me into this, because when I tried this, I was like, man, I, I have to have a bottle, um, and uh, so Lao Oud, uh, Fragnanimous is a, if you're in the United States, I don't think he ships internationally, but if you are in the United States, Lee is a stand-up solid guy, I can kind of put my name and reputation behind, I know he'll take good care of you. Um, okay, so first we're going to do a unboxing and um this is uh thanks to my good friend oliver thank you my friend he um wanted me to have some samples so the dull knife as somebody mentioned the other day said i need to sharpen this bad boy and i do need to sharpen it i suppose but uh let's see what's in here so this is samples of the pierre de valet line um pierre de valet is uh, one of Roja Dove's brands, many people don't know this, but Roja Dove actually has a side brand with some fragrances that smelled, to my nose, from what I've smelled, to be fair, I have not smelled them all, but um, to my nose, what I have smelled, they smelled very similar to some of his regular Roja fragrances. Like, for example, I think on a blind sniff, one of, I have a blind sniff um, live, live stream that I do where some folks sent me some fragrances they just numbered them and then there was like a key so I didn't know what I was smelling blind until after I smelled it and one of them I think it was called Pierre de Valet number 47 if I'm not mistaken I can look it up real quick but um let's see Pierre de Valet number 47 
Yes, it is number 47. So, um, Pierre de Valley number 47 smelled so close to Great Britain by Roja to me that I actually thought it was Great Britain. You know, when I found out it was something other than Great Britain, I was like, why would Roja release a fragrance that smells almost exactly like Britain in a Great Britain in a different bottle? Um, and of course it makes sense, you know, he's targeting people with a lot of money, and when you have a lot of money, I guess you can just pretty much buy everything. But this is one of the kind of sample sets, if you will. And so here we have, what do we have? We have um, number one. Uh, we have, so we have Pierre de Valet number one, which is an oriental floral. Uh, bergamot, May Rose, Jasmine, Orange Blossom, Saffron, Oud, Ambergris, Cypriol, Patchouli, Musk, Cedar Wood. Okay, I get the idea. Um, number nine, which is... Uh, what is number nine? Here's number nine. Number nine is 2019, citrusy and woody. <laughs> it's compared on Parfumo to uh, Individual by Mont Blanc or Yope Ohm. So that'll be interesting. Cashmere wood, cedar wood, ambergris, musk, vanilla, benzoin, patchouli, labdanum, may rose, jasmine from grass, bergamot, lemon. Okay. Uh, so number nine, number 25, uh, number 25 which is citrusy and spicy. Oh, wow, lots of citruses in here. Lemons, limes, bergamot, clementine, grapefruit, aldehydes, florals, um, coffee and elemi and all this stuff in the base, patchouli, a very rosia-like base, lots of stuff in the base. Some people compare number 25 to a midsummer dream, which I actually have a review on the channel of. Uh, and finally, ah, the aforementioned number 47 is in here. Okay, so I'll get to do a proper review, I guess, of it. Um... Pierre de Valet number 47 is the one that I thought smelled so close to Great Britain that owning Great Britain, there would be no point, of course, in buying number 47 for me. Uh, and finally, he released a fragrance in 2023, last year, called The Oud. The Oud. And uh, The Oud was a release from last year, and it's also in this little sample set, The Oud. Um... Awesome. There it is. The Oud. So I'll be interested in checking that out. Um, but today, ah, and also we have Pierre de Valet. Which one are you, baby? Which one are you? Ah, you are. You are number nine. Okay. So there you go. We also have number nine. So good stuff. Um, I always love exploring new collections and getting to do these type of videos because otherwise, without the generosity of you guys, I obviously would never be able to smell these and do these videos. So um, that's awesome. I very much appreciate it. I heard number nine was supposed to be uh, a little bit more feminine, but we shall see. So, okay, awesome. So thank you very much, my friend. I very much appreciate that. Anytime anyone sends stuff like this to me, it, it helps with the content, you know what I mean? Because at some point, I'll get around to doing those. Who knows when? But at some point, I definitely will have so many fragrances. I don't know if you can see kind of the um, sort of, you know, the um, bases of the, all these decants up there waiting to be discussed. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of content to talk about on the channel. Let me turn this light on real quick. It seems a little dark. The Ram was wholly unprepared for this video. Okay. So, uh, let's talk about why we're all here, which is Bortnikoff. And so, um, let's say, unlike Roja's or Pierre de Valet's The Oud, which, um, if they are using real Oud, I don't know if they are or not, if they, if they, if they say they are, take them at their word, okay? But many of those houses will use, like, a Oud Accord. These are the type of houses, these artisanal houses, that use large quantities of real Oud, Okay. Uh, and so Bortnikoff is one, is one such house, of course. Um, and so Lao Oud, according to Bortnikoff, came out 2021, and it is a, here's how he describes it. I have made many compositions with Oud. Each of them has its unique character. However, the note of Oud in my fragrances has never been so powerful and animalic. I will agree with that. Um, that is actually very, very true. And we'll talk about, as we talk about the um, composition and as how it kind of unfolds on my skin. 
Uh, I've never made an, uh, has never been so powerful and anim animalic before the release of the new Lao Oud. Six months ago, a magnificent oil from Laos fell into my hands. It smelled of honey and flowers with a characteristic animal note. I have been lucky enough to visit Laos more than 20 times. This is a beautiful, small, and inhospitable country where time seems to have stopped at the end of the 19th century. Therefore, remembering numerous trips to Laos, I almost immediately found the main harmonies for the composition, which was based on the oil of Lao Oud. This oil smells extremely close to Indian, but it is much softer. I supplemented it with the notes of beautiful Lao coffee, frangipani flowers, the smell of incense that comes from many ancient monasteries in Laos, and fresh spices, cinnamon, and pink pepper. So the new Lao Oud appeared, a walk through... Uh, Vientiane, an ancient city on the Mekong River, the most oody and coffee-like animalic fragrance in the Bortnikoff Parfums collection. Okay, so uh, if you watched my hour and a half or hour and 40 minute, uh, however long it took, top 77 artisanal fragrance video, you know that there were three coffee fragrances from Oud Houses, let's say, that were highlighted in that video. One was Ensar's Rumi, which I actually have a review on the channel. You can check it out. The other is Arige Ladore's uh, Kopi Luwak, I believe it was called, or, or um, Oud Luwak, I think it was called. And um, that is named after Kopi Luwak, which is a coffee that um, is basically, we'll talk about it when we talk about Lao Oud as well, but um, the civet eats the berries, they shit them out, and they literally brew that for coffee, and it's extremely expensive coffee, all right? Many people tell me it just tastes like regular coffee, but some people pay big money for that particular coffee. But um, Russian Adams Oud and coffee is my favorite take on it, but all three are brilliant. Um, even Rumi by Ensar, I really, really enjoyed. You can go check out what, what my thoughts were. I've got a video. Go to the Ensar playlist. You'll find it. But the, the coffee note in particular is done amazing by all three of those houses, okay? Uh, and this is one no such exception. Exemption. This is an amazing oud, animalic oud coffee chocolate, all right? So the, the Cliff Notes version, if you want like the 30,000 foot overview, if you said, Ramsey, um, I'm going to turn this video off as soon as you tell me the 30,000 foot overview, how would I describe it to you? I would describe it to you as this sits right in the middle of oud monarch is right here, which is a many considered to be his chocolate oud, but in reality, there's a lot of florals in Oud Monarch in the top that come out to my nose that a lot of people don't highlight. And so I'll, I'm going to wear that tomorrow for Valentine's Day, and I'm going to do a review of Oud Monarch for you guys. So we're going to make this Bortnikoff week. Screw it. And um, and Oud Maximus, which is kind of seen as his most aggressive, classic animalic Oud, here. So this sits in the middle of those two, because this is also a coffee Oud, but it's the oud is more animalic than the oud in oud monarch. The florals are less are turned down, and so many people call this, if you will. I've heard people refer to this and oud monarch as sort of um, Bortnikov's version of Russian Adams' work. And what's interesting to me is oud monarch, and I guess you have to have some experience with Bortnikov's work to kind of follow where I'm going with this. But oud monarch smells much more traditionally Bortnikov, if that makes sense. It is blended in a way where the, the oud note doesn't kind of punch you in the face, right? It's it's blended in a way where it's more harmonious on the skin and you get more of those amazing Bortnikoff florals in the top, which I've talked about before, is one of his big strong suits. Bortnikoff loves florals and he uses them in a way unlike I've ever smelled with any other perfumer. It's really uh, like his magic trick, if you will. And so to me, if I were trying to point you to a fragrance that smells like a Russian Adam creation, this would be the one. This would be the one, Lao Oud. And it's interesting because uh, Russian Adam, on one of our live streams, I forget which one, he's been on the channel four or five times now. You can go check it out. There's an interview playlist. You'll find all the interviews on there with John Beeble and um, Sultan Pasha, Mark Sage, all those people. But uh, 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 <laughs> let's try this again, Ramsey. Let's try to speak English this time. Um, so Russian Adam has been on the channel four or five times, and on probably the first interview is when we really dived into the history, I think. If you go watch the Russian Adam interview part one, he mentioned that he was very strict because Bortnikov and, and Russian Adam founded Feel Oud together, okay? And so when they founded Feel Oud together, they were in each other's presence all the time, distilling oils and stuff like that, right? And, and so when they each went to go create their own brand... 
Uh, Russian Adam was telling me he was very strict about not wanting to smell Bortnikov's work because he wanted his work to be his and he wanted Bortnikov's work to be Bortnikov's, right? They didn't want the styles to merge together into one until they released the new Feel Oud collection, which I have reviews on all three on the channel already, okay? So that was extremely important to him. So, and you definitely get the difference uh, when you smell the two styles. There's a big divergence between the styles. And I land usually heavier on the Russian Adam side. Um, and that's more my taste. I like the fragrances where the musk note, the oud note, the animalics, you know, the real ambergris are all turned up. I like fragrances that are heavy on the nose, right? This feels like Bortnikov does a Russian Adam interpretation, if that makes sense, okay? So, um, this opens up on my skin, basically, when you first spray. You're going to instantly notice this powdery chocolate, and I've talked about cacao previously, and I actually have some cacao absolute, and I've dipped the blotter in on previous videos, um, and I mentioned that when you smell cacao absolute in its pure form, it smells like, imagine the deepest, darkest dark chocolate. You have to go for dark. Think about um, a dark chocolate, not a milk chocolate, but imagine the deepest, darkest, richest dark chocolate you could ever imagine. And that's what just the cacao absolute smells like. And so when you smell this though, there is a little bit of an element of that deep darkness, but it's, it's much more, it's almost like it's the dark chocolate infused with powdery which I think comes from a couple other places, but there's this powdery feel um, along with a little bit like you're like you're smelling dark chocolate and milk chocolate combined. You can still pick out little bits and pieces of the heavier dark chocolatey gourmand chocolate absolute, cacao absolute, but it doesn't feel as heavy and, and dense and thick and rich. You know, the when you smell actual cacao absolute, it smells like you're just diving into a pool of the deepest, darkest chocolate you could ever imagine. This has touches of that, but it also has touches of powdery, smoother cacao, right? So the first thing you're gonna notice is this chocolatey note um, mixed with animalic barnyard oud, okay? And it is deep, it is rich, uh, and just imagine this Indian oud sort of gives it this kick from the very beginning. The Indian oud is barnyard, it's animalic, it's fecal, it's, I know some people don't like when I describe oud as fecal, but there is this blue cheese, this uh, fertilizer chip, this, um, there's definitely this funky, okay, this funky uh, animalic smell that if you know ouds, mostly comes from Indian oud. And if you paid attention to the blurb, he said that this oil smells extremely close to Indian, but it is much softer. If you go to Parfumo, they actually have two ouds listed, Indian oud and Laotian oud. I believe that. That definitely sounds, from what I'm smelling, that s smells like, um, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Now, the actual note listing says oud from Laos, tonka beans, crocodile wood, which we'll talk about later, coffee, oud from India. So he does credit the Indian oud. Vanilla, absolute, birch tar, and gaiac wood in the base. Um, I guess I should read you the heart and the top since I read you the base. The top is magnolia and pink pepper. The heart is cacao absolute, peru balsam, beeswax absolute, chamomile, and cinnamon. Chamomile is what I'm guessing is maybe giving a little bit of this powdery um, softness to it. Chamomile is a very um, refreshing, almost relaxing note to me. So it's funny, if you watch other reviews of this on YouTube, many people point out there's this bright, fresh, sort of... Um, um, you know, sunrise relaxing feel to this fragrance. And, and I think it's coming from a couple of the florals that mag, uh, that uh, magnolia and chamomile and, and Bortnikov loves sort of mixing. He loves, um, you know, mixing florals in a way that we're just not used to smelling in the West. Very few people smell fragrances nowadays with a magnolia chamomile blend, if you will. And along with that, the coffee hits my nose pretty early. Okay, so instantly you're going to get it. I've read some people and listened to some people talk about Lao Oud, and they're like, oh, you get the coffee in the dry down because it's listed in the base. But this fragrance doesn't hit me that way. Um, I get all of these things periodically just kind of thrown to me. Uh, and the coffee comes at me very early, okay? Uh, it is not as prominent as the coffee, I think, used in 
um, Oud Luwak, which is Ariz Ladore's creation, or Rumi. I think the coffee in uh, Rumi is very front and center, extremely prominent coffee note. You can't miss it. This one, it's more part of the blend. You know, it's Bordnikov using his impressive blending skills, but it does hit me pretty early. And sometimes you'll get that coffee note, and the coffee smells like you're smelling coffee in civet. It really smells like you're smelling the coffee from the Kopi Luwak, which I was mentioning earlier. Basically, they call it coffee civet, uh, or, or Kopi Luwak is, is known as coffee civet. And so what ends up happening is um, the coffee is the coffee cherries, as they call them, are digested by the Asian palm civet. The Asian palm civet eats it, literally shits it out. They take those, they literally dig through the poop, take them, take them out, and distill them. Okay, crazy, crazy that people pay big money for that, but they do. They say it adds an extra flavor to the coffee. It, it's crazy what people will, will pay for. I've never tried it. But if you look it up, like trying to, um, let's say one cup of Kopi Luwak costs somewhere between $50 to $100, okay? So you thought your $8 Starbucks was expensive, uh-huh. Um, and, and, but, but what's interesting is, I, I don't think there's any civet in here. I think that Animalic Accord is coming from a blend of the coffee and the Indian Oud, because I think you get that Indian Oud pretty early on, and it makes it smell like you're smelling Kopi Luwak coffee. Um, but uh, imagine blending it with a lot of chocolate. I would say, you know, it's a heavy animalic Oud that's on your face in the beginning, along with that chocolate note, and the coffee's kind of playing third, third wheel. Since Valentine's Day is tomorrow, it's third wheel on the date, okay? The chocolate and the coffee are, are more front and center. Um, and along with that opening, along with the coffee, the chocolate, the oud, that's where you're going to pick up that floral accord, where I really think adds some of the powderiness, the freshness that some people are picking up. And if you pay attention, you'll get it. It's not as prominent as the floral accord in oud monarch, which I'll review tomorrow. Um, if I remember that I said I would, but, um, it's, it's fresh, it's sweet. It's like a floral punch, right? So the magnolia gives a little bit of this earthy floral punch. They say magnolia smells a touch like rose. There's a little bit of rose with a citrusy, lemony edge and, a, and, it, and slightly earthy. Musky is, is kind of the descriptor, if you will. Um, and it can, it can also add a little bit of creaminess along with those slightly citrusy notes. And what's interesting is if you watched my review yesterday of Amber Cologne, I focused heavily on the frangipani because frangipani... Uh, adds a creamy, tropical aspect to it. I think it's much more turned down here, but I think what he's done is he's blended a little bit of that frangipani, which is almost like a little bit of a DNA, like a calling card for Bortnikoff, in with the magnolia and the chamomile, which I think adds a little bit of that powderiness. Um, so you get this kick of oud, and you get this punch from the florals. And really, I mean, the punch comes more from the chocolate oud combo with the with the coffee playing third third wheel, right? Um, so I wouldn't call this an angry fragrance by any stretch of the imagination. I wore this to work today. It worked brilliantly. I love wearing these kind of fragrances to work. But, um, I would say that, you know, this is for the people who like challenging frags. This is not for the people who like the softer, easier to wear Bortnikoffs, okay? Many people, if you, um... You know, if you listen to kind of what is said about Bortnikoff, there are some very interesting videos when uh, Arige Ladore and Bortnikoff both put their brands out. Many people tried to kind of put them in a box. You know, they said Arige Ladore fragrances focus on one note or they like try and um, they're, they're very heavy on the nose and they wear heavy in their, in their um, you know, and, and they have lots of overdoses of natural ingredients and Bortnikoffs wear softer and they're more w well blended and stuff like that. That was the... That was what people were saying in Fragcom when these two houses, which they're really friends, but competing in the same artisanal space came out, right? Uh, and, and so this Bortnikoff goes against the grain. This is for the people who like smelling heavy animalic ouds when you first spray. Um, you know, this sort of throws the um, talking points to the wind, okay? It, it goes its own way. Um, and... You know, I, I really like the uh, funky, cheesy, barnyard aspect of the oud in this. And what I really like about it um, is that it lasts. So 
I would say for the first hour, I sprayed this on, it's six o'clock, I sprayed it on around five. So I sprayed it around, I sprayed it on again, I reapplied here on this hand, which I have not applied anything on this hand all day. I only, when I applied before work, I went here and I went here, okay? So I can still smell the dry down, so I didn't, I didn't disturb my dry down, but I wanted to reapply to get that opening again. And so I'm about an hour in and I can still get the funky oud pretty prominently, but it's toning down from where it was. The first hour is really where you're gonna get that funky oud. And it stands in stark contrast to, you know, there are some fragrances out there where nowadays you spray it and you're like, oh wow, that oud opening is amazing. And then five minutes later it's gone, you know, or something like that. This is not that at all. This really lasts, the, the funky oud really lasts into the dry down. And along with that, you're going to get these denser, what I call syrupy notes, okay? I know they're not syrupy notes, but if you look on Parfumo, you're going to notice a couple. Beeswax Absolute, Peru Balsam, and Birch Tar, okay? And so don't, don't look at that beeswax note. Many people see that beeswax as honey, and they think that this is going to be like boss number one, and it's not. Um, in fact, I almost can't pick out the Honey Accord by itself. I can't isolate it, if that makes sense. But what it feels like to me is it kind of feels like that um, it is part of the combination. So you feel its presence, even though you don't smell it like you smell a honey note, for example. And if you just imagine sort of um, mixing these ingredients together, imagine you're in the kitchen making a cake, it's Valentine's Day, and you have your beeswax, you put it in the bowl, you put in parabalsam and birch tar, and you realize, oh shit, all of this parabalsam and birch tar drowned out the beeswax as I was mixing it together. But you know the beeswax is in there because of the blend and just how thick and, and gooey it is, right? And and that's the way that the beeswax feels in this composition to me. Um, you're not going to smell it like you will with boss number one, um, which I have a Vintage Hall of Fame review on on the channel if you're interested, but just imagine you're mixing the ingredients together and it's it's kind of part of the blend, if you will, okay? And um, so, so that funky oud opening really lasts. It's funny because I put this on at um, like 6.50, right, or 6.55. I get to work by 7.30, so I'm still within that hour time frame. And I'm like ducking and dodging people as I'm going to my desk this morning because, um, you know, you could really smell that funky oud. And I didn't want someone to say, did you step in shit or something? Which sometimes they will say with uh, with oud fragrances. Uh, but I love, I absolutely love this. This fragrance is my kind of Bortnikoff. There's a lot of Bortnikoffs over the last couple of years that I really feel like the house let me down. Like they went in a direction that I just can't follow. Some of those colognes that they did with the weird color plates on the front, I sh excuse me, I thought they were absolute shite. Uh, I really did not like Scheherazade. Um, so I just felt like the house is going in a place that I just can't follow. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and this is one of the Bortnikovs that really speaks to my heart, along with the, the I've got uh, probably four or five more Bortnikovs still to review on the channel, but this along with Oud Maximus, which when I ranked my Bortnikovs, I put Oud Maximus number one. But wearing this today, I'm like, man, this is, if I re-rank this, I would have a hard time not putting this just above Oud Maximus. Um, and Oud Monarch, those those three are like staple Bortnikovs, some of the Bortnikovs that he's most well known for. Um, and I and I just really like that it feels heavy on the nose. You know, I love Arise Ladori's creations because they are so overdosed in real musk, real oud, real ambergris. This feels like you're getting a quality oud fragrance with all of the fixings is really what it feels like to me. Some of it done in a Bortnikoff style, like the florals and, and cinnamon and pink pepper and stuff like that. Um, and some of them done in a little different style. I think some of them done more with that heavy Russian hand that uh, Russian Adam talks about all the time, right? So... Um, this is still in production. It's $350 for 50 mils. The other thing I should talk about is this interesting note. They call it here, um, they call it crocodile wood here in the base, but it's actually known as Terminalia elliptica. Terminalia elliptica. And apparently, interestingly enough, um, it is sort of a um, member of the Thymolacea family, 
which is not an ocularia tree. It's not a proper oud tree. It's a it's a different tree species, and apparently it makes these very impressive wood that um, when if you buy like fraudulent or if you buy fake oud, it's usually this crocodile wood. Okay, it, they're usually sold online, or, or or what they'll do is they'll use real oud and then they'll add shavings of this crocodile oud to boost the yield. Okay, to dilute the profile to make it. Um, seem like there's more oud there than there actually is. So that's why it's very important to buy from reputable people. Uh, I, I also used a term yesterday when uh, reviewing amber cologne called bo Boya, B-U-A-Y-A, -A, Boya. I think he he spelled it B-U-O-Y-A, I can't remember. But uh, apparently it's like oud that's been distilled a second time. So they distill it and then they distill it again and that Boya is the second distillation. Uh, and, and so, but basically this crocodile oud, if you will, note in here, it's supposed to be like a cheaper type of wood to boost the profile. I respect the hell out of uh, Bortnikoff for putting stuff like this in his note listing. It would be very easy to leave stuff like this out. You know what I mean? Like, why put boya oud? I didn't even know what that was till I looked it up yesterday. Or why put crocodile wood? Most people have never even heard of it. And it's funny, if you click on that note on Parfumo, that Terminalia elliptica note, which I'm pretty sure is the crocodile wood note, Bortnikoff is the only brand that has it on there. There's like three or four Bortnikoff fragrances that list it as a note, and that's it, okay? Uh, but just as a respect for him doing that, I mean, I think it's awesome that he actually puts that on there. Uh, it doesn't make me think less of it. It actually makes me think more of the brand, in my opinion. And so this is when Bortnikoff was really firing on all cylinders. 2021, he was still, I think, everything. Even though this is the second cap, like I said, the wood cap is the first. This is the second cap version, and if you go try and um, sort of buy it right now on the Bortnikoff website, you'll get the third iteration, which looks like it's very similar to this, but the cap um, looks like right here, like there's some barbed wire around it, all right? So that's an easy way to tell. It doesn't have the B here anymore. It doesn't have that B there right there. It's got like this barbed wire look, and so that's an easy way to tell the third iteration, but this is an X-Tray. So yes, it's $350, but you get 50 mils, okay? So, which is a lot of juice when you're dealing with an X-Tray. And I could smell this all day. Even at 415, as I was leaving work, I could still smell this. So the last part of the scent that I kind of want to highlight is that oud profile as it dries down. So what I like about it is this oud profile sports all of the aspects of oud that I love. Sometimes you'll get this smokiness, which very well could be not necessarily the oud, it could be the birch tar, okay? Uh, and the birch tar gives off this scent profile that almost feels like you're smelling this Russian leather note in the base of this, like an Eastern Russian leather note, you know? Like, like a Russian leather note created with ouds and all these other amazing things we talked about. But along with that, you're going to get, uh, to, my, to my nose anyways, the dominant note of, of the oud profile is the Indian oud. And, and the Indian oud is going to give off those fecal, animalic, the more challenging touches. And, and then you have the Laotian oud with, along with it. But sometimes when you smell as it dries, after it, it never truly gives up the ghost. Like it never uh, smells just boring, vanillic in the base or anything like that. That oud profile really does last, which tells me uh, that he used a good quality amount of oud and, um, you know, the fact that you can smell it even late into the dry down, it doesn't smell as animalic or challenging as the first hour or so, but the fact you can still smell it and you get those little, almost like nose tingling hits of, of oud, tell me he's using, uh, quality and a lot of, it smells like there's a lot of oud in, in the composition. The oud note is prominent in the composition, let's put it that way. And so sometimes, you know, when you smell it, um, you're definitely going to get the touches of the oud that you that that many oud heads are looking for. Sometimes this smells slightly leathery, and again, that may also come from the mixture of the birch tar. But the animalic oud mixing with that leathery feel, that Russian leather feel, um, the smokiness from the birch tar, the woodiness is just beautiful. It's just a beautiful dry down. It's a beautiful composition. Um, it has risen up my favorite Bortnikoff ranks. The more I wear it, the more I love this. I'm so glad to have a bottle. Um, it does look like that gold cap is almost discoloring a little bit. Maybe just from fingers touching it and stuff like that. This side looks darker 
for some reason. See it? You can almost see right there. It looks like it's dark on this side, and this side's lighter, but um, that means nothing. And and the uh, little sediments and 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 floating around, I just don't think he um, I don't think he drained it very well. Uh, but um, I love this stuff. Absolutely love it. One of my favorite Bortnikovs. Can't believe I took this long to review it. So we'll do Bortnikov week. I'll review another Bortnikov tomorrow. The Oud Monarch, which is a long, long time coming. One of my favorite chocolate ouds. But I, I would also consider this. You know, if you said, Ramsey, what's your favorite chocolate oud that Bortnikov did? I would put this above Oud Monarch because of everything I said here earlier with the animalic, especially if you like those animalic challenging fragrances, if you like a fragrance to really grab you in the beginning, you know, or if you're not really into ouds, if you want a fragrance to kind of um, shock you, this is the one to, to go for. I think Oud Monarch is, we're going to talk more about the magnolia and the flower aspect, the floral aspect of it. Um, and, and so this is the one, this is, you know, this is his chocolate oud, but it's also his coffee oud. So amazing scent, right up my alley. The kind of thing that, you know, once you get off of the beaten path and you start going to the artisanals, in my opinion, this is the kind of stuff that I want to wear and get to know. So if you have experience with Lao Oud, I would love to know your thoughts. Um, oh, and by the way, since this came out in 2021, there is no wood cap version of this. So um, you know, this, this version is the oldest version that you will find. You won't find a wood cap. It didn't come with the wood cap. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you have experience with Lao Oud, if you have experience with Bortnikov, uh, let me know what your Valentine's Day scents are going to be. I don't think I'm going to do like a Valentine's Day video, but chocolate and Oud easily. These, these are Valentine's Day scents. I think Lao Oud, um, because it has more of the challenging aspect, maybe, Somebody who has some ill intent on Valentine's Day. I think Oud Monarch is a better Valentine's Day scent. But um, but yes, I'll be reviewing some chocolate ouds. This will be my my Valentine's Day uh, recommendation for, for all you folks out there. These two. So anyways, hope hope to hear, hear your uh, thoughts in the comments. Love seeing your faces down below. Cheers, guys. And I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.